Hi guys! Tornado FX 158 is around the corner and it introduces a couple of new features that I'd like to, to show you right now. And to show you these features, we're going to create a small massive detail uh, kind of uh, editing form application. So let's start by creating a, a new project. We'll call it MD Demo or Master Detail Demo. And we have to make sure that we use Tornado FX 158 snapshot for, for the, to get these features. Before we look at the actual application we're creating, let's create the model. We need a person model, so let's create a package for models and uh, then a person class in there. So the person class will have a uh, first name of string and a uh, last name of string. We'll keep it simple for this demo. Let's convert these to uh, Tornado FX properties, like this. And uh, let's add some uh, some parameters to the primary constructor to make it easier to uh, to create such an object. Actually, of course, we want first name first. <laughs> and we'll assign these values here, like that. And we're also going to use the new item view model, so we can have one of those auto created for us. Sorry, generate view model, that's the one I want. So this might look a bit strange if you used the view model before, and I'll get back to how this works. But for now, let's just pretend it's a normal view model. It has our uh, uh, last name and first name properties uh, bound to some person, but we don't have a person in there. If you remember, we used to pass in a person in the constructor of the, the person model, but we don't use that, do that anymore, and I'll show you why in a second. Let's go on to create uh, a view. So uh, we're going to have two views. We're going to have one list of persons and then an editor. So let's start by creating uh, the lists. So this will be called person lists. It will be a view. And the root will simply be a table view. Now we need some data for for this demo, so let's create a controller and the controller package. Let's call it person controller. It will extend controller and it will contain a list of persons. Now we might as well just add some some test data to to that list when the controller is injected. So persons plus like that. In a real world application, you would probably not expose a list like this. You would have a function that you could call asynchronously to, to get your data from either a database or some rest call or something like that. But for the demo, this is fine enough. Let's go back to the person list and uh, let's inject this controller here. Now we can fetch the list of persons and, and back our table with that. We need to add some columns. So it will be first name. And one for last name, of course. Let's set the, the resize policy to smart resize policy. Now this should already uh, create a list of uh, persons in a table. So we can run this, and just a view and see how it looks. Right, so it seems to work. Just gonna remove this uh, tool window so it doesn't pop up on every run. So we got the person list, and then we need to create the person editor. And uh, up until now, it's uh, it's like we've always done it, really. So we'll call this person editor. It will be a class. This will also be a view, and it will contain a form. 
So this form will have a field set, of course, and then two fields, one for first name, which will be a um, text field, and then one for last name. Now we need to, to get hold of a, um, a model somehow. We already created the, the first model. And uh, instead of just instantiating it uh, like we used to do, we will actually inject it this time because that's now possible. So let's say model is a person model by inject. Now this, this person model will actually be a global uh, person model right now. So if you inject it in different classes, you will get the same instance. That might be fine for some uh, use cases and others not. So we'll look more at that in, uh, in, a, in a minute. Let's just add a save button here also. And uh, let's commit the model on save. We don't bother with any kind of um, input validation for this demo. Okay, so we know that we can inject this model and it will be the same uh, instance if we inject it in other views as well. So let's go to our person list and inject it there as well. So what we want to do is to make sure that when, when you make a selection in the table view, we will push the selected person into this model. And that's quite easy to do now. You can say bind selected to the model. That is actually a shortcut for uh, you see, bind selected normally just binds towards any kind of uh, property, but it also knows how to extract the property from an item view model. So that's why we can use this shortcut. At this stage, we need to take a closer look at the, the item view model. So let's go into the source code. You will see that it extends view model and it takes a type parameter. What it gives you is a simple object property of the, the type that you specify. It also has this variable that acts as uh, getters and setters for the item property itself. Furthermore, it has an empty Boolean binding that you can use to check if this item view model is now backed by an actual item or if it's empty. Because now it can actually be empty and, and you, you know before you had to have something to be able to, to bind against, but you don't need to that, do that anymore. Also, it provides this neat little thing so whenever the item inside the item property changes, the, the view model will be rebound. So let's look at our implementation. See now uh, it's actually allowed to return null from bind. It will still use the, this, uh, the type of uh, this uh, parameter to decide what kind of, uh, of property the facade is. So if I specify the type, you will see it's still a property string, even though the item can be null and when the item is null, uh, this will just be initialized as a, a, an empty simple string property, actually. And uh, whenever the item view model is backed by an actual person, then uh, this binding inside would change to, to a binding towards the last name property of that person instead. And this has some very nice uh, side effects, actually. So uh, we have the editor, we have the, the list. Let's go into the main view and wire them together. So in this, this uh, H box we have, let's uh, add uh, the person list first. And then we will add the person editor. We can call this the person editor as well. And let's make sure that the person editor has an uh, H grow property, uh, H box constraints, H grow priority always. We can also say that we want it to be at least 300 or 300 when we start the application wide. Okay, so the main view should be ready to run. We can try it. So nothing is happening here. And why is that? Let's have a look. The person list binds towards the person model. We make sure that whenever the selection changes, the model item is updated. Now in our person editor, we must of course bind to this person model for something to happen. So for the first name, 
text field will bind towards the first name property of the model and in the last name field will bind towards the last name property so when we rerun the application now we should be able to see that when we select an item it updates in the editor also when we make a change it's not immediately shown in the table because we haven't pushed the change back from the the input field back into the model but when we push save it's pushed back so this works as we would expect and now we have a much cleaner way of sharing a model between views we could of course uh, make this editable if we want to have kind of a two-way situation and we'll make sure the the table is also editable That seems to work also. Now let's have a look at scopes. If I wanted to be able to open a new window and uh, edit different uh, people, this will kind of fall through because uh, now the person editor is can only just display one person and that's from the global person model. So first we will go into the main view and we will change it uh, a bit. We will wrap this in a VBox. And uh, above the person list and the per person editor, we're going to add a menu, menu bar, one menu, call it window, and then a menu item, which will be new. What we want to do then is find the main view and open it in a new window. This really can't work. If you know how views work, they are singletons. So if I do find down here, I will actually just find the instance that I'm already in. And if I open that instance in a new window, well, we're not going to get what we need, at least, because we will rip out the, the this root. It will be ripped out from the, the stage it's in, and it will be transferred to the new one. So this looks kind of buggy, because now I can you know, I can edit here, but nothing happens when I click around here because this scene graph is not really here. It's just not updated, but it's moved into this window. That's not what we want. So find can now operate on scopes. So if I instantiate a new scope and send it in as the, the second parameter to find, then uh, what we now tell the framework to do is to find the main view in this scope and since we create a new scope of course uh, it can't exist from before so a new instance will be created for us and furthermore when the main view is found in this new scope uh, this scope will be the default for when you inject or use uh, scopes in the in the other places so down here this new scope will then be active when we do this if you do find inject or stuff like this where you just add a class to to a, a list then uh, uh, find will also use the the original scope of the um, the surrounding object so that means we will get new instances of, so of person list and person editor as well so this small change here will actually give it give us what we want let's try to run the application again we can make a change here and say John X then open a new window and uh, now we can still edit this and John is uh, is not the same John in this window you see we can change here but it, it won't be reflected here and that's because as I said in person list we inject person controller and uh, when this person list is uh, created it will have that new scope so it will tell inject to to use that same scope when it looks up the person controller so what we could actually do here is say that we want to inject, but we want to use the default scope. That means that uh, page and person controller is now a pure singleton again. Now there will only be one instance because every time I inject or find the person controller, it will uh, find the instance from the default scope. So now when we run the application with this small change, we get totally different behavior actually. So now when I open the, the other window, 
and I change John, it's reflected in the, the, this window also because now the the data backing this uh, these two uh, windows are coming from the same controller and the same instance of this list of persons. And also, if I, I change here, of course, it's going to update here. That's pretty interesting. Now, since we introduced scopes, we could do another thing, and that's uh, to create a subclass of scope and put our data inside the scope because we have now a scope variable available here and you can actually override it to, to uh, make it uh, appear of a certain type if you want and um, uh, we will look at this strategy in another screencast and that that's the strategy of transferring the view data inside the scope instead of using injection uh, towards the specific scope so hopefully this gave you an idea of the power of the new item view model and also the scoping. Um, this scoping feature will be critical to support uh, environments like uh, JPro, for example, where you need a separate scope all the way from the application class and up until all the, the instances of uh, everything you create uh, because you, you need one instance per visitor, but it's still in the same JVM. So uh, that's actually the reason we introduced scopes. And then we, we kind of uh, stumbled upon this uh, great other use case. Actually, it was uh, Carl Walker who, who said that MDI applications uh, could be uh, supported using this feature, and it turned out perfectly. So I hope you enjoyed the screencast, and I hope you will clean up your existing TornadoFX applications uh, with this new technology.